So welcome to my talk, Traits and Trade Objects, more than just interfaces. Um, it's, it's going to be um, a quite exhaustive talk for Traits and Trade Objects. So even though I'm, I'm going to uh, repeat a lot of concepts that might be familiar if, you're already, um, if you've already worked with Rust, I'm going to go quite far into the details of the more um, advanced topics in, um, in Rust. But if you're completely new to Rust, you, you might have to uh, rewatch it um, for the more advanced topics later on when, um, once you're more um, uh, once you're more advanced in it. Uh, I'm going to talk about what, what a trade actually is, um, what the orphan rule is, you might have heard about it, um, generics, namely trade bounds and generic types, then uh, trade objects, the memory layout of trade objects and the object safety rules. Um, especially, um, initially for me it was hard to, to understand all those uh, object safety rules and, and why they are um, how they are and um, that's why I'm going to go over every single one of these and explain why they are technically necessary um, because of how trade objects are implemented. Then I'm going to go over generic traits uh, and then uh, traits with associated types. So let's start with what is a trait? Is it an interface or maybe a type class? It's, uh, it's, if it, is it just a collection of methods? Um, the Rust um, reference calls it a um, shared behavior, so a behavior that is shared between different types. And I can give you a simple example. This would be a trade shout that has a method. It's called an as uh, associated function, but I will call them methods because I, I'm just going to call it the wrong thing anyways. Um, and this trait can then be implemented on a type. So in this case, we have a struct called dog. It doesn't have anything in there right now. Um, and we can implement the, um, the method on, on the dog. So we implement the, the name of the trait, shout, for the name of the type, which is dog. And then we implement the method here. In this case, we don't have any self parameter or anything like that. We'll see about that later on. Um, let's take a different, uh, let's um, use a more advanced example. I was saying that the traits are implemented from outside of the type itself. They are tagged onto it or attached to it, which is quite important. Um, uh, which you will see in this example. Let's, let's say you have duration types from different sources. You can substitute any other kind of type that um, you might have from a separate library or, or maybe an ORM system or whatever, maybe some database wrapper. Um, in this case, it's a duration. And we have three different variants of it. Um, we have one with uh, days as unsigned 16-bit integers, one, one with seconds, uh, and the standard duration from the, the standard library. Um, and what we are currently in this example are interested in is the number of days of that duration. Um, the traditional solution would probably be to make a wrapper type for, that implements a, a common interface for all these types if you want to um, write code that works on all of them. Or maybe you could make a, a new type that you convert everything to. But with traits, you don't really need to do that. What you can do is you can um, define a trait called duration in this case um, with a method days that takes self by reference and returns uh, a 64-bit number of days. And this trait can now be implemented um, separately for all of these um, different types. So for example, for the days type earlier, um, it looks like this, or maybe if we have 
the, the standard duration, it will lo would look like this. We take the seconds and divide it by the number of seconds in a day. But just like that, we have unified these three completely separate types under one single trait that we can use. Um, we're going to go back to that later in some further examples. Um, traits can also have default implementations. So for example, in this case, we have um, predefined the shout method um, to shout the sound of silence if there's no um, explicit implementation of the method on the type. And, yeah. Can uh, the associated function later be uh, overwritten by the implementation? Yes, it can. That's, uh, that's the um, idea. Otherwise, it wouldn't make any sense really to, to put it in the, in the trade if it couldn't be over, overwritten in the first place, I guess. But yeah, it's just a default implementation. And if you provide your own, then um, your, your own will be used. Um, then there's super traits uh, that's similar to an inheritance in other languages that have interfaces. For, in this case, uh, you wouldn't usually use the two string trait directly, but it's quite easy to, to showcase. Um, you could, for example, um, require that shout um, types that implement the shout trait already implement the two string trait. And you could um, make it take advantage of that fact by providing a default implementation that just calls the two string method. So it now says shouting and the, the two string of the type that you're implementing it for. And um, in case you want multiple uh, traits that you want to implement, uh, that, that you want your trait to, um, to have as a prerequisite, you can have uh, multiple separated by a plus. Like in this case, clone and two string. Doesn't really matter what these uh, traits are right now. What's important though is a trait can be implemented on any type. Uh, in this case, you can see that I've implemented shout for a 32 bit integer. And so any type definitely means primitive types as well. And most notably, this means you can implement traits on types that you didn't define yourself. The example from earlier where you would have some external library and you have a type that comes from that external library and you want to um, use it interchange interchangeably with some of your own types uh, as, as one common interface, so to say. Um, you can make your own trait and implement it for that foreign type that is allowed. And traits can even be implemented on generic types. So let's let's say we have a trait identity that just defines the identity function that uh, that returns whatever you pass in. You can implement it for for any type t, meaning that any type you can think of will uh, will now use this implementation of the identity method. Um, I'm, I'm going to go back uh, to, to, to this later on, especially if you combine this with uh, trait bounds. Um, although, although I was saying that you can implement any trait, uh, uh, sorry, that you can implement traits for any type, there are some limits. For example, if I try to, imp uh, try to implement the display trait from the standard library, to the standard unit type. For those of you who you don't know Rust, this is just the empty tuple. So it's it's a it's like void. Let's say you can compare it to that. Um, if I try to do this, the compiler will yell at me, and it says only traits defined in the current crate can be implemented for arbitrary types. And this is where um, the the but in implemented for any type comes in, which is the orphan rule. 
And um, I'm going to present a simplified version of that. Uh, the reference has um, more detailed explanations on that. You can implement local traits on any type. Local traits meaning traits that you implement in your own crate. A crate is a library. Or in, in, in C++ terms, it's a compilation unit. And you can also implement foreign traits on local types. So if you didn't define the trait, but you defined the type, you can implement the, the foreign trait on your local type. Somebody's uh, currently, yeah. Thanks for muting. Um, yeah. And why is that? This prevents ambiguous implementations. You don't want to get uh, into a scenario where you have um, two competing implementations of the same trait for the same type. Um, this is also called the hash table problem. If you consider a hash table that stores um, values based on keys and you have different implementations of the equality trait, then you could get like undefined behavior because um, one equality definition is different than the other and you could get collisions like uh, that way that weren't there before, for example. What you can also not do is making overlapping trait implementations. If you remember the identity example from earlier, I implemented identity for any type T without con uh, any constraints whatsoever. If I now try to implement identity for one single concrete type, I32, I will get a compiler error. It says conflicting implementations of trait identity for type I32. And then it tells me that the first implementation was over there in, in this line. So this is something you can also not do. This is because of the same reasons, we don't want to have any ambiguous implementations of a trait for any type. So now that, that we know that, or, or so far, any questions? I heard a chat message. Okay, that was just a greeting. Um, let's continue then. Can you explain or uh, orphan? Once again, sorry, you say again. Uh, this is Rajkumar. Uh, can you explain orphan rule once again? You the, can, the previous, like, yeah. You you can. If if you define a trait locally in in your own library or your own binary, you can choose uh, on which types you can implement it. You can implement it on any type you want because it, it cannot ever conflict with uh, anyone else's implementation. You have the ability to, to implement it for everything else. Um, this works because if somebody else were to use your library and use your trait, they are not allowed to implement it for anything but types that only you can see. Okay, got it. Thank you. That that is the the basic idea. There's... Are there no other um, possibilities for clashes, like um, having methods with the same name from different traits, or implementing a trait for a type? Which yes, I'm. Has I'm going to. I, I was just about to um, talk about that. Um, okay, so. So let's go forward again. How can I use my trade methods? And that's actually where this kind of collision um, comes in. Uh, if I have static trade methods, so no self parameter, I need to import my trade. And then I could either call it on the type that implements the trade. In this case, if the dog has already has a shout method, then it will use the built-in shout method from, from the dog. And then I need to um, use this syntax to make sure to use the uh, shout method provided by the trait and not the one provided by the dog itself. 
That's why there's this more convoluted way of calling trait methods. And similar, um, let's say we w were to use toString. Actually, the, the toString is already imported in every Rust program, um, but let's pretend it's not. You need to import the trait, and then you can either use a value and call the method on that. If that's not possible, you can use the um, type and get access to the method like that and pass in the value. In this case, it's by reference because toString um, gets a reference of a toSelf. Or you could use the full syntax i32 as toString uh, colon colon toString um, which is non-ambiguous or not ambiguous at all. And even with those um, easier uh, syntaxes you you won't get you you will only get ambiguities in your local module um, based on which uh, use statements you have um, so there's no global possibility of um, conflicts there any more questions okay and let's talk about generics there was something in the chat i think that was just a comment um generics let's first talk about trait bounds um if i have a method that is generic over t I can constrain the T to implement uh, a certain type, uh, a certain trait, sorry. So this method requires all values that are passed to it to, to implement the toString trait. This is similar to, to what Java does with generics, where you can re um, require your generics to extend another class, for example. And um, also similar to what Java does, if you do that, the only thing you're allowed to do with, with the value is to call the methods provided by the trait. In this case, we could call it with one, for example, or with hello, which both implement the two string trait. Um, note, however, that this is different from C++, for example. I'm, I, currently, I'm not sure if I have a slide for that. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, it's similar to um, generic bounds in Java and TypeScript, for example. The only, the only what is on the trait can be used. So you need to constrain more um, if you um, to to more traits if you want to use more traits. Um, if you take C plus plus concepts, for example. Um, there you still have duct typing capabilities. So even if you do not uh, provide any tra uh, bound for any concept, you can still try to use any property of any type. And if it's not there, it will just fail to compile. It only constrains the caller of the um, function in C++. And there's a great talk about that from Connor Hoekstra. It's called concepts versus type classes versus traits versus protocols. And he goes into um, these differences in more details. There's also some syntactic sugar. Um, you can condense the where uh, syntax to, um, to inline trait bounds like this. So T needs to implement two string, same method as before. And there is the impl um, syntax, which is similar. It's not exactly equivalent. Um, this is different in that the method now doesn't have any trait bounds. Um, so if you want to implement a trait that has a, gen a generic method on a trait, you cannot use impl for that. And there's more limitations that we'll see later. Um, also, the impl only works in functions and methods, so if you have a generic um, struct, for example, uh, impl won't work there, at least not at the moment. Also not for let bindings and stuff like that. Then there's abstract return types. 
Let's say I want to uh, return a closure that takes a text and just prints it. You can think of this like a constructor. Fn is the trait for a, for a um, simple closure without any side effects. Um, we, you could, if, if you're a Haskell person, we could debate about that, but uh, not right now. Um, and this says, this function returns some type that implements the fn trait with uh, a string uh, slice parameter. This is important because it supports returning unnameable types like closures in this case. You, uh, you cannot um, write down the, the type of a closure because every single closure, even though it takes the same arguments and has the same return values, uh, if that's the case, even then it's a different type, one separate one for every single closure. So for example, if we try to do that, um, let's say we want to have one standard out version and uh, one standard error version, and we try to, in this case, return uh, the closure that prints to standard out, and then in the else case um, to standard error, and then try to use uh, the input trait. It doesn't work. It gets an uh, there, there's an uh, a compiler error uh, that the implementation of fn once is not general enough. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of this error message. But um, what's important is um, every path returned from um, uh, returned to an input trait needs to be the same type and not just the same generic type, but the same concrete type. And the other thing is, if you try to do something like um, return a closure that works with every single type that implements two string, you cannot do that either because nested uh, trait implementation, uh, nested input trait is not allowed, as the compiler helpfully says. You can only um, you you can can only return concrete types from a function, and um, this only goes one layer, because um, if we were to return something like that. Uh, the compiler won't know what types you are going to call the um, the closure with, so it, it cannot know which type belongs here. And it needs to be one single concrete type. It's been another message. I also have a question. Okay. Uh, so in the previous slide, I did not understand uh, why the re return type, the concrete type in the two return cases was not identical. Um, that's just how, how Rust closures work. Um, every single Rust closure has a, a different type from other ones, even if it has the same arguments and same return type. Okay, got it. And the way closures, closures work is um, they have they, impl they all implement the same traits, but not the same type. There's also a different concept of function pointers, which, um, which uh, gets around that limitation if you, if you need it. But function... So Fn, um, so Fn and, and then brackets in brackets ampersand string is an abstract type. It's this is a trait. trait. The Fn is a trait. And there's also okay. the lowercase fn function pointer syntax, and um, but that doesn't allow you to have um, internal state, for example. Got it. Thanks. Uh, I'm hearing some cars. Okay, where was I? Okay. Um, both of these problems that we just encountered can be fixed using trait objects, but I'm not going to go into that right now. I'm going to go into that later on. There's also marker traits. These are traits without any methods uh, and are just for use in trait bounds to constrain what types can be passed to a function, for example. One example is uh, the send trait. 
and it marks types that can be transferred across thread boundaries. In this case, the, um, the implementation of the trait is unsafe. You, you, you need to use unsafe code to implement it because um, this needs to be guaranteed, uh, the thread safety of a type needs to be guaranteed before you implement the t uh, this trait on it, otherwise you would break uh, the language essentially, or the safety guarantees of the language. So how is this useful? There's uh, the spawn method, the standard thread spawn. It takes a um, closure that returns um, a type, and this closure will be run on a different thread. And as you can see, both this type and the closure itself need to implement uh, the send marker trait. Otherwise, this will not compile. So um, what the compiler would say, in, for example, if I try to send a reference counter, uh, counting type to a different uh, thread by spawning, it, uh, spawning a closure that use it, it uses it on a different thread, it would complain that um, a reference count of a uh, 32-bit integer cannot be shared uh, between threads safely. And that's where um, a lot of the um, concurrency safety guarantees of, of Rust are coming from. And there are also um, different tra uh, traits like that. In this case, send is also an auto trait, which means it automatically gets implement implemented by the compiler for, for simple cases where it's possible. So for almost all um, safe Rust uh, data types, um, it automatically gets implemented. And only if you use special um, types, usually for use in, in unsafe, it, it won't implement it automatically. And you need to then use the unsafe uh, keyword to implement it manually if you are 100% sure that your type is thread safe. Others are, for example, sync, unpin, unwind safe, or ref unwind safe. I'm, I'm not going to go in the details there. So now that we know about the um, trait bounds and uh, generic methods, how is the code for these generic methods actually generated? And that's a concept called monomorphization. Um, if you have this method, for example, which takes a value that implements the two-string trait, and you call it with uh, an integer and a string slice, then it will generate separate implementations, uh, like stamping out templates, um, separate implementations for every single type, uh, so that you have concrete methods to call. So in this case, a, a I32 version of the method and a, a string slice version of the method, and those will then be called. The name monomorphization comes from uh, going from a poly polymorphic semantic, in this case, the, um, the impl implementation, to a monomorphic version that doesn't have the polymorphism anymore. The polymorphism goes away by just copy pasting out different uh, implementations for different types. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, does uh, the impl keyword imply such monomorphism in the compiler? Or uh, is this a general rule if I omit the impl? Uh, it would also monomorphize uh, also. Um, every time you use um, traits without trait objects, it will do monomorphization. I don't think this is absolutely strictly guaranteed. Um, the, the Rust compiler is free to generate different code in, in, in terms of optimizations that not everything is monomorphized, but currently at the moment, it will always be completely monomorphized. And this can also lead to um, inlining, for example. So you might not have the monomorphized implementation left in the finished binary because it might get optimized away but uh, initially it will fully monomorphize it. And it, it doesn't matter if you use um, the explicit generic uh, generics with 
trade bounds or if you use the impl syntax of that. So in, in general, um, it will always break down uh, the trade. It will deduct uh, the type and then create a monomorphism for this. It, it doesn't need to do any, of, of course it does type in, uh, inference over here, but in this case it was, um, the, the type where, where it comes from is just in, in every use. So if you don't use a particular type with that method, it won't create a, uh, an implementation for that combination. Okay. So um, the DIN keyword you all will also discuss. Yeah, that's the trade objects. That's the next big thing okay. in, in my talk. Yeah. So before that, I have a small intermezzo, uh, namely generic types. Let's say I have a wrapper type, generic over a wrapped type. You don't always have to call your generic types T. Just saying. Um, and you could then constrain the type definition itself. So for example, uh, put a tra trade bound here, like that. Uh, in this case, I chose uh, default. But you might m sometimes only, or it, it's actually recommended, only want to constrain the implementations um, of these. So you can, for example, make conditional um, implementations of traits for types. In this case, if, uh, if for any wrapped type that implements the default trait, implement, uh, uh, implement the default trait for wrapper with that type inside. So if I'm wrapping a type that does not implement default, it won't implement default. If the, uh, the wrapped type implements default, the wrapper al will also automatically implement default by doing that. So it's a conditional implementation of additional traits based on uh, traits of some of the generic uh, parameters. And this is useful, for example, if you have wrapped types like this. For example, this is quite common. You have a, an atomic reference count of mutex of your of my type, and you uh, you can initialize this just using the default trait implementation on the arc, and it will automatically know how to fill in the internals if they if, if my type implements the default trait. Uh, you have a typo here. I? Yeah, there's a missing um, uh, brace here. Correct. I might fix that uh, or I might not, not sure. <laughs> but thanks. Um, this also works for regular implementation blocks, not just when implementing a trait for a type, but also when implementing normal methods for a type. For example, um, um, if the wrap type implements to string, I can add a print method to my wrapper type. So I'm implementing methods for a wrapper of wrapped. If wrapped implements to string, I add this method um, that just says wrapper and uh, then prints the to string of the wrapped one. Uh, and the compiler um, will tell us if if this type inside of there is not implementing toString, uh, the method print doesn't even exist. So this, this or it, it says it does exist, sorry. Um, I can't scroll anymore. Wait a minute. Okay, it says the method print exists for the struct wrapper, but its trade bounds were not satisfied. And then it complains uh, that the two string bounds are not satisfied for the um, unit type in, in this type here. Which means if this were a type that implements two string, I could call the print method, otherwise it, it's not possible. 
Also, these... What is the trade bound? Hmm? Sorry? What's the trade bound? A trade bound is the, the syntax that constrains a generic type parameter that I showed earlier. For example, the... Um, let's see. This. We have a generic par parameter followed by a colon and then the name of a trait or several uh, with a plus in between. And it, it's called a trait bound because it restricts this generic parameter to, to only those that implement this trait. So it binds the, the, the <coughs> general type that could be anything to, down to only types that implement this trait. That's why it's called trait bound. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and this also works on trait methods themselves. You can have a method in your trait that only exists uh, if certain uh, bounds are satisfied. For example, you could constrain on self uh, to make it debug. For example, if you, uh, self is the type that the trait was implemented on. In the earlier example, self would be the type dog. And we could say like um, the debug method only exists if self implements the debug trait. It's not very useful what I'm doing here, but it's just an example. You could all, you can also derive traits uh, using this syntax. Um, if you have a, a, a data structure, in, in this case a struct, you can use derive to automatically um, implement things like default or clone if all of the members of the type also implement them. In this case, um, because of this derive and because i32 um, implements the default trait, I can create a new wrapper of i32 def um, via default like this. It, this is similar to the example with the arc uh, mutex um, earlier. And also clone is then automatically implemented as you can see. And um, using procedural macros, you can, um, you can implement this yourself uh, or by using libraries. In this case, a, a fairly common library, the SERDI library, serialized, deserialized, that's where the name the name's coming from. Um, it has the traits serialize and deserialize, and you can automatically de derive them on structs, for example. So I made a small uh, point uh, struct with 64-bit floating point, so double precision. Um, and all I did was the derive of ser serialize, deserialize, and the SERDI library will automatically generate the trait implementations for these both traits. So in this example, we could write something like, uh, I have a, a JSON with X and Y. This is just the um, raw string literal so that we can use um, double quotes inside of the string. X is set to 1.0 and Y is set to 2.0. And to get a point from that, we just use SERDI JSON, which is a different library that relies on SERDI's deserialized trait, um, and tell it, Create, uh, create something from string uh, from this JSON and unwrap it. It knows th that it's a point because of uh, type inference. You could also tell it which type to, to parse it into. And you can uh, see if, if that were to be executed that this assertion doesn't fail. It correctly parses the struct from uh, that JSON. And if you then do the reverse, so the JSON to string, taking a point, unwrap because it can can fail. Um, just the error handling. Don't don't do that in production code. Um, and it will generate the same JSON starting from that uh, struct with the 1.0 and 2.0 in there, as we had in the beginning. And there you can even see like um, how these kinds of traits can be useful across different libraries. Um, they are shared. Many, many libraries implement these serialized and deserialized traits for their, for their own types in case you want to 
serialized or deserialized them. And there's different plugins, for example, for JSON and YAML and whatever else you want. That's the end of the intermezzo. Any questions so far? Okay, then I'm going back to the main, uh, the other main topic, trade objects. So far, we had monomorphization and a static dispatch. Um, we we um, had to have a concrete type for every uh, single implementation of a method that takes a trade in, in the end after the monomorphization. And the monomorphization copied the implement uh, made a copied implementation for every single type. This is good for optimization because it can do inlining and all, all that sort of stuff. Um, but also you can't re um, return different types over different paths and you cannot nest impl blocks. With trade objects, uh, you have dynamic dispatch. It stops generics propagation. What I mean by that is um, you don't have to make all of your methods generic uh, uh, such that your entire program ends up having uh, methods with uh, generic par parameters in them. You can like put a stop to that and uh, use a normal non-generic method at some point. That uh, creates faster compile times because there's less code to optimize because uh, not everything is copied around because of the monomorphization. Um, this can be quite significant. Um, uh, I was once working with a uh, with the wrap um, was it no warp with the warp um, server HTTP server framework and we, uh, the compile times were about forty five uh, seconds for just a really small server implementations because there were generics all the way down from the um, request handlers to the entire server. Um, you also get smaller binaries because you don't have copies for, of, of everything. And actually this depends sometimes if the optimizations are good, you actually get bigger binaries. But in general, if you have many different implementations of the same trait, you would get smaller binaries. And you can return different implementations uh, of a trait from one um, function. Essentially, a trade object. What a trade object does is type erasure. You might have heard of that. So trade objects work Can like. You explain it? Yeah. Sorry. So the, it's a guarantee with trade object that there is no inlining. The, the there is no strict guarantee that there will be will not be any inlining if if the compiler could in some way find the, find out that it is guaranteed that this method will only ever be called with this one single trait, it could do things like heap elision and, and inline across uh, trait objects. Although I'm, I'm not sure if um, the current implementation of the Rust compiler actually does that. But I know that the LLVM compiler does similar optimizations for C++, for example. So it, it might be possible that that happens. It's not a strict guarantee. So there is, as in C++, no obvious simple um, border between um, the, the, the static um, version and the dynamic version. It, it, it's, it's quite explicitly different um, and usually it, it would always, the one would be monomorphized, the other one wouldn't, uh, but it's not 100% guaranteed because the compiler team didn't commit to do so because it might be open to optimizations and maybe it's even optimized already in simple cases, I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Um, trade objects in trade objects, you have one dynamic implementation uh, for every type. That's important one. Um, it's similar to like what uh, Java interfaces are or how virtual inheritance in in C plus plus works. 
or actually if, if, if we're talking about Java, regular Java classes also work like that. In, in Rust there's just no in, inheritance at all. Um, so the first way you could get a um, trade object is the owned version. In this case uh, we have the same print function from earlier and the value is now a box of dynamic to string or dun to string, not uh, no idea how to pronounce it properly. And other than that it just works the same as, as the previous example. Um, when calling it we need to create a box and put the type inside of there. Um, this also works with uh, RC, ARC and, and other heap allocated types. Uh, important to know is what that does is it creates a heap allocation for the type um, and the box itself just stores a reference to this heap allocations, uh, this heap allocation. And um, we're going to see how that works under the hood later. Um, the borrowed version would be you pass a dynamic reference. Uh, so actually you can think of the dim just like the, the impl you saw before, just that it's um, it makes a trade object. Um, and doing you can do that by just um, passing a reference to the type. And this is just not the, the ownership version of, the, of that. And this means, we, since we now have type erasure, um, the, the box of dynamic uh, F, Fn is now one single concrete type, um, which means we can actually return two separate closures from a function now. Um, although previously they would be turned on the stack and now they have to be allocated on the, the heap to do so, as you can see here with the box. And what we couldn't do before, is, uh, the nested implementations is now also possible. You, you can return a closure that takes a, a trade object reference to uh, something that implements toString. So this closure that would be returned here would work with every type that implements the toString trade. So what actually is a trade object under the hood? Um, just a quick note, this, uh, what you're seeing here is a, a deprecated um, type from the standard library. It's deprecated just for the reason that um, the, the internal layout might change at any point. They don't want to f uh, set this in stone yet, so this is just a, a snapshot in time of what it currently looks like. Um, a, trade a trade object um, consists of um, a data or, or sorry, I'm, I'm going to go back of a data pointer and a V table pointer. This um, is also called a um, fat pointer. So every time you have uh, an ampersand din, or you have a box of din something. You, you get a um, you get these two different pointers that that are that together make the trade object. The data pointer just points to the actual value um, that the trade is implemented on. It's the same as a regular reference, uh, but the V table pointer is a pointer that points to a special metadata uh, about the type that implements this trade. And uh, what this looks like, I've, I've looked at it in, uh, in the debugger in CLion, and you can see um, that in, in this case, the vtable consists of this number here and uh, different stuff in there. There's, um, I can click this link maybe. In the compiler implementation, you can see something like that, but I'm going to ba go back now. Um, what it contains is the size of the type because every single implementation uh, of a trade could have a different size and if you're working with a um, trade object you need to know its size so the size is in there. The alignment, so where it can be allocated in memory 
at which um, offsets essentially. Uh, the methods that are implemented on the trade and also the references to um, super trades. So if you have a trade that requires other trades uh, as well, then you have references to the V tables of the other trades. Um, any questions so far? Because this is like all the way down of how trade objects work. And this is also how, um, mostly how, how other languages like Java are doing it with classes, um, which allows downcasting and stuff like that. And um, what C++ does with virtual inheritance. Same basic concept. There was a message. Okay, somebody joined or left. Okay, then I'm the going to... Are... Yeah? The methods are function pointers. That's an implementation detail, but in this case, methods are probably function pointers. Let's, let's take a look. Okay. No, I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> Sorry. It, it wouldn't make any sense to do something other than function pointers, so probably. Um, but let's talk about object safety. Let's say I want to make a method that takes a trade object of uh, the default trade. Then the compiler will complain the trade default cannot be made into an object. And that's because there are special object safety rules. It actually links them here. Um, not all trades can be used as trade objects. And the concept concept of ob, of object safety, um, the, I, I link the rules here. Um, if you look at the talk later, you can see it. But I've done my own uh, version of, of um, my, my own take on what they are, essentially. One is, I'm just going to quickly go over them and then go into every single one in detail and explain why that um, rule is there. One, super trades must also be object safe. The trade must not require the sized trade or the sized bound. Um, the trade must not have any associated constants. Methods on the trade must not be generic. Also, methods must not use the self receiver, uh, the self -receiver without any um, reference. So things like um, uh, borrowed self or box of self, etc., are, are okay. Methods must have a receiver, and methods must not use the self type. And also, they must not be constrained by where self is sized. But why is that so? Actually, that's that's. Um, a topic that came up a lot when I was talking to people with Rust, and even I myself was ma many times uh, implementing a trade, trying to use it as a trade object, and then think to, thinking to myself, why you dumb compiler, why don't you let me? And that's why I'm going to go into that, or I'm going into it right, right now. First one, super trades must be object safe. That's kind of obvious since a trait has all properties of the super trait. So if the super trait has a property that makes it not object safe, the trait itself will also not be object safe. The trait must not require sized. Um, sized requires um, that a type has a fixed size. Uh, and since every implementation could have uh, of the trade could have a different size, that's not possible. A trade object does not have a size. It is a dynamically sized type DST. And because the, the size of the trade object itself is dynamic, you, you, you cannot ever satisfy the bound of being sized. That's why that rule is there. Then number three, 
it must not have, have associated constants. I haven't explained them yet. What is an associated constant? Let's say I have a trait called limited number. Uh, I can say that the trait needs to implement two constants on the type, in this case the min value and the max value constant that are both u size. And I could, for example, implement them on u8 and u64, in which case um, the respective uh, minimum and maximum value would be used. And also, yeah, I could then print them like this. That's how you would use a, an associated constant of a trait on the type itself. So back to the rule. A trait object must, a trait must not have associated constants to be object safe. The problem is every single implementation of that trait could have a different constant, which means you, it, since at compile time you do not know which actual type is behind the trait object, you cannot know the constant. But a constant in Rust always needs to be available at compile time. And since you don't know the type at compile time, you don't know which constant it is, it doesn't work. That's why you cannot have associated constants in trait objects. Four, methods must not be generic. Um, the problem with generic methods is that there are infinite implementations of the method, depending on which uh, types you, uh, you instantiate it with. But as you've seen earlier, a trait object has this V table where the methods are stored, and you can, you can only store one method for, for this specific method name. In the V table, you cannot store infinitely different, infinitely many different uh, method implementations in there for different um, types that you can instantiate a a method with, and that's the reason why trait methods must not be generic if you want your trait to be object safe. Then uh, number five methods must not use the self receiver. Um, let's just give an example. Um, I have a trait foo that have a, has a method called take self that takes self um, as, as owned parameter. What you need to know is that this has a hidden bound to size. You can rewrite this one with, um, with this one where self has the type self with uppercase s, so the, the type that is implemented on, and uh, the bound that self needs to be sized. Uh, why is that? Because the implementation of the method needs to allocate stack space uh, for, for the self value. And um, if you don't know how large that self value will be, you cannot know beforehand how large the stack allocation needs to be, how much room you, you should leave uh, for that um, value on the stack, which means you cannot create a one single method implementation for every single type. The other receiver types are just references um, which have a fixed size so they are okay. So a box for example is just a pointer to a heap object, that, that's okay. And a reference to self of course is a reference. Also the methods must not have a receiver. And that's because if you don't have a receiver, in this case, uh, if you have a static method like the shout method at the beginning that didn't take self as a parameter, um, it, it, if it doesn't have a, a reference to self, it also doesn't have access to a V table because the reference to self is a fed pointer that contains the data pointer and the V table pointer. But if you don't have any V table, you, you, don't, you cannot look up any method on the trait, which makes it impossible to, um, to create a trait object for uh, a trait with a method that doesn't receive self in some way. And the last two ones, um, seven methods must not use the self type, uppercase, and methods must not be constrained by where self sized. 
it's the same uh, hidden size. It's the same with uh, the um, size bound um, that was hidden with the self receiver earlier. Um, same problem. You cannot allocate uh, the necessary stack space if you don't know the size and if you um, if you have these constraints, it's it's not just not possible to do that. So now you might be asking if it's possible to write a trait that is not object safe, how do I check? And that's where the static assertions library uh, comes in. It has a it has an assert object safe uh, macro. Still don't like the abbreviations all over the Rust ecosystem. Um, you can use it like that, in this case for the default trait, which is not object safe, and then it, it will comp uh, create a compiler error if, if the object safety is not given. But given that the, there, there's a lot of these object safety rules, any questions about the object safety rules so far? Okay. Um, there was one thing. Okay. I do have one one question. Go ahead. <clears throat> it is uh, regarding the methods that don't receive any self. Yes. So um, you said that it wouldn't make sense because then, of course, the method itself cannot look at the V table, so we cannot um, resolve anything. And that's, uh, that, of course, makes a lot of sense. But um, if we consider a case where we have a trade object and uh, the receiver, uh, sorry, no, where the caller is calling something on the trade object itself could look at the retable or couldn't it? Like, why does the method need a self-receiver for the caller Be because, being able to look into that retable? Because um, methods without the self-receiver, static methods, don't require a, an object at all. They don't require any hmm. value. They only require the type. And I see. Uh, you cannot have an. In in the if you don't have any a, a value, you cannot have uh, a trade object. That's just that's just the point. There was <laughs> one comment. Uh, Most things Rust forbids are forbidden for a reason. <laughs> That's absolutely true. So in, um, in conclusion, you have the choice. You can choose between static and, and dynamic dispatch for the same type, given that it's object safe, of course. If the, if the trait is not object safe, you don't have the choice. And that's one key feature of, of traits in Rust, uh, from, uh, from my opinion, uh, that this choice is there. Uh, some examples from other languages in, in Java, Swift, etc., they you don't have a choice to, you always do dynamic dispatch, for example. Or in uh, C++, it would depend on the type. So um, if somebody declares virtual in their type, it will always be virtual. You cannot you, it, it will always do dynamic dispatch. You cannot do anything about that. It's just given by the type. And uh, mm -hmm. in, in Rust, you can pick and choose, essentially. So let's go through the next big topic, which is where all the power of the trade system lies, in my opinion. Um, the generic traits. Let's um, start with an example, the from trait. Most of you might know that. It's a trait generic over a type T with a method that takes a T and returns the self type. So the type that the trait is implemented on top. And important about the um, generic trait, uh, generic traits in contrast to associated types, which are coming later, um, there can be multiple implementations of the same trait for the same type with different um, generic parameters. We'll, we'll see that later. So as an example, 
um, our duration from earlier, which we implemented as a trait. Um, but instead of a trait, we um, we make our type duration that has a number of days. Um, let's take a look at the chat again. No, nothing interesting. Um, we have some foreign types, the same days as before, num day struck with the number of days, second struck with the number of seconds, and uh, the standard library duration type. Um, and we want to work with our own type. We decided not to use um, traits this time. And what can we, can we do about that? We can now implement the from trait um, for our type duration, but with generic parameters for all the types that we want to convert from. So what from does is it converts from the type that is in the generic uh, parameters to the type it's implemented on. So for example, this implementation allows converting from the, the days type to the duration type. This implementation allows converting from the seconds type to the duration type. And this implementation allows converting from the standard library uh, duration type to our duration type. Um, and before we are going to use that, there's one more thing. There's this com concept of implement one, get one free, or actually get many free, but um, there's this into trade and um, it's also generic over t and this is like the opposite of the from trade if you it, it takes self and it converts into the generic parameter t so let me implement this for you says a random wizard um, this is actually an implementation from the standard library. I think everybody who, who's been using Rust um, is, should be familiar with that, but I'm going to go into the, to the details here because this is really the magic that, that enables Rust to be Rust. Um, this implementation is generic over T and U. It implements the into trait for the generic um, the into trade over the generic type u for uh, for every t where t implements the from trade which means this makes it possible to um, th this implements a conversion from t to u from t into u if there is an implementation of from t for you, as I as I just said, and this is what the implementation looks like. We get self in as a parameter. Um, we call the from method on the on the u that implements the from trait and pass in the t, which in this case is self, and then we return it. All of our from implementations that we just did. The 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 from for the duration type just got the into implementations for free. We didn't have to do anything about that. So let's go back to our example. Um, I can make a method print days, which takes something I call a duration, which is actually a trade. Uh, it's something that implements the trade into duration. I can then call the into trait method to turn it into our duration type. Uh, yes, in Rust, you can just reuse the same names with different types. That's no problem. And it's actually used quite a lot. And then we can print the days. And this can be called with all these different types. And it will automatically do this conversion because of the into implementation that we had earlier. Um, well, that's great, but maybe we don't want all that monomorphization to happen. Or maybe we also don't want to deal with fancy generic stuff and all, all stuff like that. 
So maybe we just want to write a method called print days that takes a duration as is and just uses it. And voila, we can we can do that. All we need to do is call the into um, trade methods on these types that have been uh, from the into trade that has automatically be implemented for us, uh, which makes converting between types quite convenient, and also very importantly, it it feels almost like implicit conversions without actually having to deal with implicit conversions. Rust can just not have implicit conversions at all and um, you, you make explicit then that you want to do a conversion by, by calling dot into, but you do not have to explicitly specify what you want, to, uh, want it to convert to because that's automatically um, found out or inferred. Yeah, that's the basics of generic trades. Any questions? Okay, then I'll go on to associated types. I'll also do, a, uh, do an example from the um, standard library, the DREF trade. Um, the, the DREF, is there, was there a question? Okay. Um, the DREF trade specifies what happens if you uh, use the DREF syntax um, with the ampersand sign on a type. It has an associated type which is this one called target with a trade bound question mark sized. This is actually a special syntax that's um, only allowed for, for um, some auto traits that are automatically implemented on types. Actually, maybe, I, uh, maybe what I'm saying is not 100% correct. It's, it's special for some uh, special syntax for some traits. Um, the problem is that usually you would have size as the um, size as a bound on every default uh, on every tr uh, trade bound by default, and with this you can explicitly opt out and also allow unsized types. Um, but going back to the example, uh, the target specifies what the um, deref dereferences to. And the deref method takes a reference to the type that the trait is uh, implemented on and returns a reference to the target type. This is the syntax um, for the associated type, self, colon, colon, target. And, and importantly, this can only be implemented once for any given type. In this way, it's different from uh, a generic trait, as we, we saw earlier. Um, just as an example, uh, the, the VEC, uh, which is the dynamically uh, allocated array in Rust, which has an absolutely horrendous name, which has been copied in verbatim from, uh, from the C++ vector, which was just a mis misunderstanding by Alexandre Alexandrescu, which is kind of sad, but that's where we are right now. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to stop my rambling. This is just a simplified version of what the um, standard library implements. In the standard library, there's also an allocator parameter and the impl implementation is actually use, uh, using unsafe code in this case. Um, what this says is we implement the deref trait with the, um, for, for every vector of t, t is just the element type, um, by specifying that the target of the dereference is uh, a slice of t, or actually it's an array of t, but um, a reference to an array of t is a slice. And then the implementation would call the as slice method that um, creates a slice from the, from the vector and just returns that. So by doing that, um, you can use a, a vector in context where a slice is required just by putting the ampersand operator before that. That's what the ref is doing. 
and that should explain what the target type does. It specifies this type explicitly for, for the implementation of the trait on this type. Um, in this case, there's a, there can be a bit of confusion between DREF and SREF. DREF is the one implementation for dereferencing, and there can only be one. And SREF can be implemented multiple, multiple times to dereference uh, the type that it is implemented on in different ways. For example, a string implements SREF uh, byte slice, so um, SREF array UI8, which means a slice of bytes, and SREF string slice. So you can, from a, a string, get, a, a get bytes or um, a, a string slice, whatever you want, and both of those can happen depending on the context, and it, there's not this one and only implementation. Another um, good example for... Quick question. Yeah. Can you go back one slide? Uh, oops. Uh, yeah. Um, does string implement DREF? I'm not sure. Apparently it does. Yes. It, it implements DREF with target string slice or target string, which is not a slice yet, but it, it can only exist as a slice. Yes. Okay, but also SREF for string as well. So yes. non on string, okay. It's kind of okay, um, superfluous in this case, but it, probably in generic context that, that might actually matter. Mm -hmm. Or actually it doesn't matter. I've actually used it like that, now that I remember. So the iterator um, trait is a trait that is also not generic, because usually if you have a type that, that is an iterator, you only want it to be an iterator in one way, not in, in multiple different ways. And what you specify is the item that the iterator iterates over, or not iterates over, but the 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 item that the iterator produces um, is an associated type on the trait. And what you need to implement to get an iterator working is the, this next method that returns an option of the item type. And then there, there are a bunch of default implemented methods and um, some of them you can, uh, you can implement some of them if it brings performance benefits, for example. Uh, one other interesting topic that um, also makes use of um, associated types and in this case uh, uh, generic traits as well is operator overloading. Uh, the operators like plus minus and so forth in, in Rust are all uh, implemented uh, using traits and you can make your own implementations for them. So. In this case, let's take uh, the, the add operation for the plus sign. It has one pa uh, generic parameter, RHS for right hand side, which defaults to the self uh, trait. So um, generic parameters can actually have defaults. Um, it has an output type, which means the, the type after, the, after you did the addition, um, what you get out. And then the add method that takes uh, self, the, the right hand side, and produces the output. So let's take uh, this struct, for example. We used it earlier for the um, serialized, deserialized derive. Um, it has an x and y, which are both doubles. And now we want to implement the add trait for that. Um, what we can do is we can implement add for the point. The output would be a point, which means we can add, we could then then add two points uh, to each other, and that's just what it would look like. What we could also do additionally is um, implement add with the f64 type as um, generic parameter, which means we could add a, a regular number to the point as well. 
uh, oops, uh, and uh, this is what it would look like if you were to be using this um, overloading. Let's say you have two types, uh, two points A and B, one at zero, one, uh, two dot zero, three dot zero, four dot zero, and um, if you then add them together, you would get this in our case, and it, you can also add just a regular floating point value to it and you would get that. And that was just done by implementing these two traits on there. So that was the last slide, or actually the one before the last slide. And we have come to an end, uh, and you can ask me further questions. Actually, this is where, this, where you can find the slides, and I will upload the recording here once it's ready. Great talk, Max. Thanks very much. I really learned something there. Thank you. That's very good. Yeah, thanks. Really so we have one um, question in the chat. Um, I don't know if you can answer it. I tried to, but that's over my head. Um, it, the the second last one. Um, you probably just want to read it yourself. On, see if you can on answer a that. Trade definition self is implicitly bound to size if there is a method on the trade that takes self or returns self. Otherwise, self is question mark size, right? Self can be explicitly marked size with a where clause. Um, I need t some time to process that. Oh, on a trade definition. I, I I'm not sure actually. I. I would assume that um, on a trade definition per se, the um, the size bound would be question mark sized, uh, and it only matters for the methods themselves, and they have implicit bounds. But I'm not one hundred percent sure about that. Not sure if that answer that helps. Sounds logical. It's, yeah. it's just. Um, quite down th uh, to, to the weeds, into the weeds, whatever. I'm not good in uh, at English idioms. And uh, German as well, for that matter. <laughs> yeah, but uh, if there's no further questions, I'm going to stop the recording. And uh, yeah.